Good morning, Everett Assembly. I hope you guys are all doing well. Um, we sure miss you, and we hope and pray that we'll be together really, really shortly, sooner rather than later, right? That's what we're praying for, at least. We're just so glad to be here again today and uh, again to share the Word of God. And uh, we're going to have some... Um, some really good things happening when we get back together. I'm convinced of that. We're going to see the, the glory of God working in our, in our midst and helping us and blessing us in a lot of ways. Uh, today, I want to share with you uh, a series, beginning a series of two weeks, uh, talking about the uh, our worldview. And today, I want to talk to you about the worldview um, as it relates to heaven. And next week, I want to talk to you about how that worldview relates more to us as uh, thinking about hell. But before I do that, I'm going to ask Bonnie if she would share some um, uh, announcements with you and just kind of get, keep us updated with what's going on and happening. Okay, here she is. Good morning. Bonnie here with some announcements. We are uh, happy to announce that we have more than one way of giving now. That's exciting. I'm going to give that to you first and tell you that we have an app. It is, um, let me get there. It is app.sharefaith.com forward slash app forward slash giving forward slash Everett Assembly. We also have text now. So that is... Uh, 814-205-0911, and uh, you can either type or put in the amount or the word give, and it'll take you to the giving app. Also, uh, you can go to our website, everettassembly.org forward slash give, and you can give that way. You can also give your normal way, so don't hesitate. Don't feel like you have to try all these new ways out. Just give your regular way if you want to. You can come to the church. Let us know first. You can drop it off in, in the, on the table just inside the door. Um, we are open from 2 or 1, I'm sorry, <laughs> 10, to, 10 to 2, Monday to Thursday, and uh, again, call first just in case we're not there. The number is 814-652-6917. Also, um, we're here for you if you need us. We are uh, trying not to go into the homes, but if you really need us, we do have masks now. And if you need us there, we will come. You can also uh, email us. You can call us, at, use our home number, uh, message us on, on Messenger. Um, just we're here anything that you need we love you and we want to be here for you so thank you for uh, being here with us today if you're from Everett Assembly let us know down in the comments that you're listening and feel free to say anything you want to say about um, if something that hits you with the message and you want to type something in don't be timid just go ahead and type in we are uh, just glad to see anything that you put also put a like or a love and uh, if you're not from Everett Assembly, we are so glad you're with us. Um, also, for you, um, let us know where you're coming from, uh, what town or how you knew us from before, or if you're related to us or anything you want to say. Just put something in the comments for us. Okay, we love you. It's so nice to be with you. God bless you. And here's Pastor. All right. God bless you. Hey. Time for the word. Nothing like allowing the word of God to touch our hearts and our lives. Um, I want to talk to you today with the, and ask you this question. Do I believe in heaven? Well, if I were to ask you believers, I'm sure you would say, well, absolutely. But do we live that way that as, we, as if we really do believe in a heaven? The Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, or I'm sorry, chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Do we long for God's appearing? Now, many believe that the prisons that the Apostle Paul was in in Rome was nothing more than a big cave. 
we are told that there are 20 or more prisoners that would be squeezed in an area of something like 10 feet to 20 feet. It was kind of like a tunnel that was underground, and there was a river that was flowing uh, through that, and the exit of that river, the human waste would actually go down in that area. And uh, also, even if a prisoner died, that would be kind of like used as a chute to get ready, rid of the, their bodies. But this cave was also very damp. It was chilly, had filthy, filthy water, and one oil lamp, one oil lamp, can you imagine? And then a little food, not to even mention a stench of the human decay. But this is the prison that many theologians believe that the Apostle Paul penned his two epistles of 2 Timothy and the book of Philippians. It's hard to believe that Paul could write under such terrible conditions, isn't it? Particularly the epistle to the Philippians, which is the main theme of that book is joy, joy. He writes things like this, rejoice in the Lord. Or he says something like, what has happened to me was really used to advance the gospel. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner that is worthy of the gospel. I have learned to be content in whatever my circumstances are. Paul wrote that. Then in Timothy, he writes, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Or he writes things like, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. And he said, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You can't help but think to ourself, how in the world did Paul do it? How was he able to actually say those words, pen those words to believers? How did he maintain his faith, his attitude of joy, his perseverance in the face of such hardship? Well, I believe it was because of his view and his focus was on heaven. Paul was motivated by an eternal worldview. He was not taken up with his present circumstances as though that was going to be the place where he's going to be spending the rest of his entire life. We have to ask ourselves these two questions I think are extremely significant to us today. What motivates a belief in heaven? And the second question is, and what happens when we really believe in heaven? How do we answer these questions in relationship to how we live our Christian experience that determines really what our worldview is and how we will respond to the needs of the people that are really around us? Let me ask you the first question. What motivates a belief in heaven? Now, this question can, I think, be answered when we think in terms of what is reality. You know, we have to believe that our eternal perspectives are reality and that our living out those realities of heaven helps us to embrace then the biblical realities. Let me, let me explain to you, first of all, we need to know eternal perspectives in our reality. See, an eternal perspective begins with our relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul's conviction was that we would spend eternity with Jesus Christ, which motivated him to endure for this life. You see, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, Paul writes these words from his prison cell. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. He is looking for his eternal home where there is no broken fellowships and where trouble doesn't even exist for eternity. Can you imagine that? That's hard to even wrap our head around. An absolute eternity. In this second letter to Timothy, Paul says, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which is the Lord, the righteous judge, will reward me that day. That's found in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. And to the Philippians, he said things like, for to me to live is Christ, to die is to gain. That's in the first chapter of Philippians, verse 21. 
And then he says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize, which God has called me where? Heavenward in Christ Jesus, Philippians 3.14. And then he says, our citizenship is in heaven, Philippians 3.20. See, Paul's perspective was built on the reality that there is an eternal destination. His perspective was focused on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen, he had within him the motivating factor to understanding that reality of eternal perspective. Any true believer of Jesus Christ is going to be emphatic about his relationship with God. And he will believe in heaven. But our belief in heaven is not always lived out because of the choices that we're making even here every day in our daily lives. We are often preoccupied with the cares of our life. You see, that's why we need to understand this second thing is that we should emphatically live out the realities of heaven. In our materialistic society, boy, isn't it easy to say we believe in heaven, we proclaim a hope in heaven, but we still live as though our career and our achievements and our possessions are really what is important to us. But I have to confess to you, most of the time my mind is probably like yours, full of the things that have to be done, full of the things of thinking about our jobs and our ministries that we have to do, and the family responsibilities, help, and helping us to achieve those things that we want to do in life. But we all have those issues. We all have those things that we have to, to think about every day, but we need to keep them in perspective. At the beginning of the Gulf War in 1991, many Christians believed that it was the start of the Armageddon, that was be the great battle, the final battle that will end all human history as we know it. The Bible is very clear about that. And I remember that in our church attendance was up all over the United States. People started to think in terms of their spiritual state because they feared the end of the world was coming. And there was a great concern for, for family and friends who were serving in that war. And the same thing happened at 9-11. And now we have the concerns of the coronavirus. In reality, the people should have been thinking about what the Apostle Paul said. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. In the middle of the battle, it's easy to think about heaven. But I'm not sure the reality of heaven really is lived out. But we tend to get caught up in thinking about heaven when our life is on the line and we seek for safety first and we really don't think about heaven. Unfortunately, at the end of that short war and after 9-11, people went right back to their same old lifestyle, lack of concern. And it's going to be the same with coronavirus? I hope not. I pray to God that it's not. I pray that this This um, occurrence, this illness, this disease has actually helped us to think more about heaven. And even when we have it under control, we all struggle with living in the reality of heaven. And it's human nature to be concerned about our lives on this earth. But if God is calling us, we have to trust him with our lives and realize that this planet is not our permanent home. There's a true story told about of a man named Roy Castle, a great Christian leader, and uh, he was dying of cancer, and he was holding a press conference, and following that press conference, one of the reporters asked him a very important question. He asked, Roy, how would you feel if you knew you had three months to live? And here's Roy's reply. If I knew that, I, had the, I would be the happiest man in this room because I'd be the only one in this room who knows that. The rest of you don't know if you'll make it to tea time. Isn't that interesting? We all need to face the reality of eternity. And when we begin to pursue a long, fulfilling life of God's blessings as our goal, we are overlooking eternity. God's goal for our life is to live a life of obedience to him. 
Yes, he wants to bless us on this earth. Yes, we should receive God's blessings. But our true ultimate blessing is to be with him forever and forever in eternity. Jim Elliott was the great missionary that was martyred many years ago back in the 1950s by the Indian tribes. And here's what he said. He is no fool who gives what he can't keep to gain that which he can't lose. Let me repeat that. He is no fool who gives what he can't keep to gain that which he can't lose. Maybe if our perspective was right, we would do a better job at understanding our struggles. And then I think also we must embrace biblical realities. The Bible opens our eyes to understanding that this world is not our ultimate destination. No other author in the New Testament wrote more about heaven than the Apostle Paul did. He also lived out his convictions, constantly risking his life and safety. He said things like, the suffering of this life cannot be compared to the glory of heaven. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. And listen to these words in Acts chapter 20, 23 and 24, where Paul is talking to the elders at Ephesus. And here's what he says. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. See, Paul paints another reality in Romans chapter 14. Verse 7 and 8, he says, If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, yes, we belong to the Lord. Again, Paul exhorts us to follow his example. He states, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden in Christ, or with Christ, I should say, in God. You see, the biblical reality is not to run from death, but to realize that not even death in our life can change the fact that we have an eternal destination that far outweighs our problems and our complications in this life and far outweighs our experiences that we may have in this life. But our temporary sacrifices we make in this life do not have the weight of destroying us because we live in our convictions that eternity is real. It is our final destination. We are told that some 60% of the pioneer ministries or missionaries who went to Africa died within the first two years of their ministry. We would not have had a revival in the continent of Africa if it was not for those missionaries that believed in the reality of heaven. There is the reality of heaven to gain for those who have found Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It is our responsibility then to share that truth to those who are lost, or the reality for them is hell. Here's the second question, the last question I want to ask today. What happens when mankind really envisions heaven? I think, first of all, it gives us strength to endure our hardships. In Hebrews 11, we have the Hall of Fame of Faith. We are given a view of those who willingly sacrificed and persevered in running the Christian race. In this chapter, we're urged to run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. And then the writer points out that Jesus is the eternal vision. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and I'll just read a small portion who for the joy set before him endured the cross. There was a missionary mother in Eastern Europe who reflected on this eternal perspective when she said this, I am not a foreigner because I chose Romania. I am a foreigner because I chose Jesus Christ. You see, keeping our eyes on Jesus motivates us to persevere when we're struggling. Why can I go through hardships and plow through things in spite of how I feel? Because when my eyes are on Jesus, I realize my eternal rewards are the ultimate delayed 
gratification. Secondly, it gives us motivation for great courage and sacrifice. Martin Luther King Jr. said, and I quote, no one really knows why they're alive until they know what they die for. We need a vision for our life that supersedes our desires for self-preservation. If the fear of death overwhelms us, then we will never venture into the poor places, the violent places, the dangerous places of life. And if we don't participate in reaching people in all walks of life, who will? See, a youth group from church prepared for the missions trip to West Africa, and the parents raised a number of health questions and concerns, particularly those pertaining to HIV and, and AIDS epidemic. Those questions were more like a smokescreen because they were really, within themselves, they were very fearful and afraid of their children going. Finally, one mother's 16-year-old daughter burst out saying, Mom, if I go to West Africa and die there, I guess I'll just see you in heaven. She was exhorting her mother just to have an eternal perspective. So when Jesus challenged his disciples in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, he said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Jesus was calling them to be courageous, sacrificial, bold. He was asking them to die to themselves. But notice Jesus said, we must deny. He must deny himself. There's no other choice. Involvement with following Jesus Christ, whether your home overseas, requires both and many varieties and different shapes of death. Some will literally be asked to die. Others will be asked to die to selfishness, materialism, maybe consumerism, and others may have to die to understanding they need to learn to, to fulfill the Great Commission and not think so much of themselves. And finally, it keeps and helps me to detach us from our worldly possessions. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, here's what Paul says. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul encourages us not to be arrogant, nor to put their hopes in wealth, with this, which is so uncertain, but to put our hope in God, who richly provides for everything for our enjoyment. God wants us to enjoy life. He wants us to have the, his enjoyment, his blessings of life. But we're commanded to share those blessings. And because when we do, we will lay up treasures for ourselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that we can lay hold of the life that is truly to come. You see, if an auditor look to evaluate someone's net worth, he sees in financial terms what investments that have been made. This tells them what they really believe in. It would be mutual funds. It could be property, land, what, whatever. But this is what Paul is challenging the people in Timothy's church. We have to live with a spirit of detachment, our stuff, because that all our resources are given to us by God, are they not? They're all given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ. And but God wants us to invest them for eternity. There is an old hymn that goes like this. Faith of our fathers, holy faith. We will be true to thee till death. One of these verses speaks of the children of martyrs. And it says this. How sweet would be their children's fate if they, like them, could die for thee. That's a radical statement. And we have to think twice before we actually sing that and act on it. You see, our, our lived out belief in heaven changes our worldview because it suddenly awakens us to the fact that life is more than this world. 
and that all that we accumulate. Our belief of heaven inspires generosity, encourages perseverance in the face of our opposition, and it gives us the joy that Paul had even from a prison. I want you to think about this in closing. Think about three or four decisions that you're facing over the next few months. And I want you to ask, how do I face these decisions differently if I really believe in heaven? I'm going to ask that you really think about that and consider it seriously. What is your worldview of heaven? It determines how you respond in this life. I'm going to ask today before we leave you that Bonnie would share a prayer with you, that we would pray together concerning this message, and that she would close out uh, today's um, today's service together. God bless you. We pray that God keeps you safe, and we love you, and we want God's very best for your life. God bless. Hi. That was so great. Thank you, dear. It's been a long time since we've heard a message on heaven, hasn't it? It, it reminded me of three things. One is that in recent years, like the last couple of decades, people who think about heaven and talk about heaven have been blamed for having an escapist mind view, mm-hmm. worldview, mindset. And they just say, oh, let's get busy. Let's work. Don't, don't be thinking about heaven. Just get working. But, you know, you can do both. You can work for the Lord and still not forget about heaven. And I think we need to take these words to heart. The other thing that, that came to me was the, the virgins who were waiting for Christ. Um, well, actually, they were waiting for their bridegroom. For us, it's Christ. And some of them had their oil lamps filled. Some of them didn't. But, you know, when a bride is waiting for her wedding day, she is thinking about her groom all the time. They want to be on the phone together. They want to be going out on dates together. She's planning on getting her um, all the plans set, you know, buying the wedding gown, setting up, sending out the invitations. We need to be like a bride, so excited, waiting for our wedding day and watching for our groom. And the other thing that I thought of was that old song, This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me to heaven's open door, and I don't feel at home in this world anymore. You know, we need to be like pilgrims, not like permanent residents. Let's not be too at home in this world. Let's pray. Lord, We come to you, Father. We come with repentant hearts because we have not always been thinking about you the way we should, thinking about your soon return, thinking, Lord, that you could come in the next few moments or our life could end in the next few moments. Father, help us to think about heaven. Help us to think about your return. Help us to be thrilled and excited and not to hold, not to clench this world too tightly in our hands, Lord, but to be open-handed, Father, being willing to let it all go, let it all go in a moment, Lord. Let us die to self. Let us die, as Pastor said, to our um, indulgences and our, our consumerism. Lord, let us be um, just at work where we should be, like acting it out, acting like a Christian, acting like you're going to return, winning souls, caring about other people, giving. And Lord, we just thank you, Father, that you um, that you're gracious with us, Lord. You, uh, you're long suffering, and Father, and you're so good to remind us of these things. And Father, especially now while we have this pause, let us take this time to reprioritize our lives, Lord. And one of those things that we reprioritize, Lord, is 
watching for heaven, watching for your soon return. Lord, we just thank you. We love you. Father, and I think about people who heaven is not even on their radar because they're not even saved. And I pray, Father, for anybody listening to us today, Father, who is not saved, Lord, that they would accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and be saved. And for others who have grown lukewarm or cold, Father, that we would rededicate our lives to you. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this word. Father, and we give our lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Sorry, I cry easily. Um, so we just want to say goodbye. We love you. We're so thrilled that you're with us. And if you watch later after the live video is finished, uh, still put a comment in because we will go back and we'll look at those comments and we just get excited to see people from maybe years ago who we knew from a long time ago that get on or people that in, in the church who didn't get a chance to watch live but get on. Just go ahead and comment. We love you. Take care. Have a wonderful, God-filled day.